in my 30 years or so as a, a magazine editor, I got sued for libel just the once. Just the once. Um, and it was one of the most devastating things that had ever happened, but that's another story. Uh, our final keynote of the day would probably have it that getting sued just the once is probably a bit of a poor show. And that I really, really should have tried harder if I wanted to be a proper journalist. Um, he is, after all, reputedly the most sued man in Britain. He has been the editor of The Great Private Eye for over three decades, and uh, uh, one of the team hosts on Have I Got News For You for nearly as long. He's an, author, he's an author, he's a documentary maker, he's a playwright, and he's even been the subject of his own spitting image puppet, a program for which he was one of the original writers. Um, please welcome the man of whom Piers Morgan said, uh, my intention is at all times to severely embarrass and humiliate him, and lower his standing in the public eye. <laughs> That's the language he understands best. The bane of Robert Maxwell, Jonathan Aitken, Neil and Christine Hamilton, Mohammed Al-Fayed, and yes, Boris Johnson, he could not be more welcome to our stage. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the wonderful Ian Hislop. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm often asked about my own libel record, which, despite what you may have implied, is actually extremely good. I fought 40 cases and won one. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we lost the costs on that. Who was that to? Who was that to? Now, that was to an accountant. The shame of it. <laughs> it was. And it cost £100,000. Look, I, uh, Ian, I want to start with, yes. um, I want to start with uh, the, the pressing news of the day, and that's Piers Morgan. Um, yes. Uh, he, he published the following to his Mirror re readership, and I promise that after we've covered this, we're not going to go back to Morgan. Oh, let's. He said, he said, I quote, he wrote to his entire readership and said, we've got a sneaking suspicion that Ian the Gnome Hislop is not quite the squeaky clean saint-like choir boy he feigns to be. Have you got any photographs, writes, uh, writes Morgan. Ian might prefer not to reach a wider audience. I'm prepared to come to individual arrangements to pay for last-minute dynamite. Now, there's no smoke without fire, Ian. Yes. So what, what did he know that we don't know, and what was it like being investigated by Morgan? Question one, what does Piers Morgan know that everyone else doesn't? Nothing. Um, <laughs> on any subject at any time. Um, Piers was incredibly annoyed with me and devoted vast amounts of the resources of the Daily Mirror um, to investigating me. And this was because Private Eye had run a story saying Piers was using his own paper to tip shares which he was buying, which he was, which you or I might think makes him a bit of a crook. Luckily, this wasn't proved. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, Piers got very, very cross, and he sent a huge number of people down to the village in Kent, where I lived, in Sissinghurst. Um, and he was very, very thorough. And uh, not only did a number of my neighbours say um, there are a lot of journalists around, I had a phone call from my vicar, uh, who said, I've just had a, a call from the Daily Mirror. And I said, oh, I'm terribly sorry. And he said, no, no, um, they wanted to know whether you'd confessed anything juicy. And being my vicar, he, he said, well, firstly, I had to explain to the mirror that in the Church of England, we don't have confession. Uh, <laughs> that was the important point. Um, and secondly, he didn't have anything to offer. Understood. Um, but this continued for, for a very long time until one of the reporters that Piers had put just sitting in the drive. So he took photos of me every morning doing the school run. Because I do the school run. I am marvellous. Well, I was for about a week. <laughs> um, and then this guy was just handing out there, and one of my neighbours is a retired policeman um, who didn't know who this bloke was and went up to him, smashed on his window and said, are you a fucking pedo? <laughs> um, <laughs> at, which, at which point the mirror retreated. Um, so 
in the end, it was actually I found it was very good to be on the other side of the tabloids, yeah. just to just to see what would happen. And how are things between you now? They're fine, yeah. No, we're great uh, friends uh, yeah. now. <laughs> no, I, I was thrilled to see him interviewing President Trump. You know, one yes. of those situations where you think. Now, who do I dislike the most? Now we're going to get. Now we're going to. Now we're going to get to Trump. We're going to move it. on to that right away. Now, when I spoke, we, we had a briefing call a, a couple of weeks ago, and I think on the very day um, that we spoke, I think Trump had called for the use of guns in classrooms. The idea of um, uh, yes. uh, teachers packing heat. And whereas the rest of the world, and I'm sure most people in this room, uh, maybe not, maybe some, uh, so, oh, God, oh, no, what, what's this all about? I suppose somewhere in a parallel universe in your offices in Soho, the private eye offices, I just imagined you all high-fiving each other yep. and going, this is comedy. I can imagine you high-fiving, <laughs> doing this thing. Yeah, we do but a I lot can of imagine, that. Imagine you thinking comedy gold. Now, th this office, talk to me about this office where kind of bad news is, is good news. Give us a Give us a flavour of how stories are chosen and how they make their way to the page. Do you mean about Trump or just about generally? Uh, uh, Trump and uh, generally. Well, the problem with Trump is you have to find the things that he doesn't find funny. Mm. I mean, this is the job for satirists, and the American satirists have got very good at it. If you say you're a ridiculous, overblown, fat, blonde groper, you know, his core vote loves that. Um, you know, that's why they voted for him. Um, <laughs> It's true. So that stuff won't do. You have to find stuff that hurts. I mean, and again, a lot of people found this. You say to Trump that you were always a flop at business. You got a lot of money from your dad. You invested it badly. You're the only man in history who lost money running a casino. <laughs> I mean, the average Italian immigrant did that for 30 years. Um, Trump failed. That's the stuff he finds less amusing. Uh, yeah. And that brilliant Michael Wolff book was full of suggestions that um, the attributes that he claims about himself aren't actually true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, he's very successful f f with women, except the ones who know him. <laughs> it's, it's not only Trump, is it? I mean, the, 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 you've got a slightly wider problem in the, you yes. know, in the world of sort of Trump and Boris and Farage and, and Rhys Mogg. It, arguably, they don't actually fear laughter. The, comedy is their thing. That's what they do. Yes. So where does that leave somebody like you? And also, I mean, do you fear feeding their ego? I mean, mm. this latest copy, let's have a, just whip it out here. Yeah. This latest copy of Private Eye has got, uh, for those that can't see it, sorry, we should have had it on screen, but it's, uh, it's Max Mosley's Racist Past Revealed. And on the left-hand side, we've got Channel 4's Kathy Newman saying, this must be very painful for you, to which Max Mosley replies, yes, please, don't stop. <laughs> um, knowing uh, a little bit about Max Mosley's past, you'll, you'll get the gag there. You've left the bottom bit out. Oh, says, uh, the, uh, the eye says, thanks for the memory. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so what's the, the, there's a real problem here for you. In the, we, we're kind of moving into a world that's beyond satire, surely. Well, I mean, the good thing about Max is... is like a lot of people in England, he knows that you have to pretend to find it funny. That's one of the rules of public life. Yeah. No matter what people say, you grit your teeth and you say, oh, yes, that's very funny. I've got a sense of humour. Oh, yes. Um, and Mosley said, I thought the private eye cover was very funny, which is great, because I shall use that in court if he ever sues me. Um, <laughs> any suggestion he's been caused hurt or damage, which apart from being what he likes... Um, <laughs> I, I, sorry, it's, <laughs> it is pathetic, but... I just can't resist it. Um, he has now made it very difficult for him to engage in further legal action because he's said what he claims is an incredibly damaging episode in his past which should be forgotten and the data should be removed. He's now said, I find it funny, which is terrific. Um, and it is funny. Um, and that is why we go on talking about it. Um, and again, you say, is there a problem with, say, Rhys Mogg or with Boris? Um, Again, the things are, at what point does it become um, damaging yeah. uh, to them? I mean, you know, Rhys Mogg saying he's um, stuck in the 19th century and um, he's uh, got a lot of views that um, people find out of date isn't particularly damaging. To say he runs a hedge fund, which has made a huge amount of money out of Russia, and perhaps he could give some of it back, I don't think he'll find that very funny yeah, yeah. in the coming weeks. And he's not so ancient, he doesn't know how to manipulate um, the, the current markets. I mean, there are ways of getting underneath people. And the thing about private eyes, the thing 
we do is we do jokes and journalism and a, a sort of mixture of the two. So you tell people um, what they don't know and then you make jokes about it. Let's talk a little bit more about that private eye office then. Uh, yeah. I, I asked you originally this idea of how a story actually makes its way to the page. So, for example, uh, this afternoon, most of you will know that Rex Tillerson's been sacked, uh, yeah. the Secretary of State. Um, so how does a, a sort of fact like that get turned over by you or your, by your journalists or by your freelance writers and end up on the page. Talk yep. to us about the process of actually filtering the real world into the pages of Private Eye. Well, I mean, again, you don't have to go very far with Rex Tillerson. Um, you know, he was put in there because he'd done deals with uh, the Russians um, in the oil business. Um, yet last night he made a statement that wasn't terribly pro-Putin. This morning he's gone. Were I the special investigator... I would put two and two together <laughs> and think and make <laughs> <laughs> um, a four fairly quickly. Um, so in terms of what does that mean, I think it doesn't take much to guess what Trump means by that. Um, in terms of investigative stories, um, that's slightly harder and I mean, it's slightly more difficult. Um, those stories, um, Paul Foote was our greatest and best journalist. It was a, a fabulous, he was... Um, 30 years, one of the founders of Private Eye, and he was always asked, what's the secret of investigative journalism? And Paul said, uh, people ring me up and they tell me things. <laughs> That's it. Um, and in a sense, I mean, he was underselling his own talents, but that is true. I mean, Private Eye is essentially a club, and it depends on people in specific industries. F for example, the ones many of you are in, um, uh, engaging with us and saying, if something's going wrong or you think something's bent or something isn't right, just letting us know. And that is how nearly every section of the eye works. You know, the, the hospital roundup is entirely um, one pissed off um, hospital doctor and all his mates. Um, the bit in the energy industry is just full of people from the energy industry who are not very happy about it. Um, the, the stuff about public transport, guess what? It's them. Um, <laughs> The reason we tend to get our stories right is because we're told them by people in the middle of them. I mean, the skill is filtering out the grudge, the malice, the hatred, some of it, um, <laughs> and then leaving the story in there. Um, but essentially, um, we've always functioned by um, getting people's trust, um, saying, you know, uh, we, <laughs> we won't turn it over, we will give you the story yeah. um, as done, and, and running it. Um, and in the end, that's what works for us. I, I suppose one of the, I, I sort of started this conversation about this idea of you know uh, the, the, the amount of times we have or haven't been sued. And mm. back in the day, that was kind of the biggest thing to fear. Mm. I think you know whatever your whatever your legal budgets might have been in order to defend yourself. But that was the biggest problem that you could have. Yeah. I suspect that this is a bigger problem now, and that this is this whole the rise of people taking offence. Yeah. Um, which is in its way somewhat even more dangerous, because the idea of somebody taking offence at what you've written or what you've said can have really s increasingly serious implications. What's your view on this world that we live in, that where people seem to be ever increasingly prone to say, I find that offensive and I think you should stop? Yes, I mean, I find it um, increasingly worrying, because it... It not, down, not only shuts down jokes, but it, it shuts down debate. And I don't mean in that in the sense of, you know, the pub ball says, well, I, I'm not going to be PC, but, um, you know, there are a lot of them coming over here. Uh, it, that isn't what I mean. It is just the sense that um, people are keen to identify the truth with whatever they happen to feel at the moment. Um, and uh, they take offence not only on their behalf, but on behalf of other people half of whom don't feel offence. I mean, literally, my favourite story about the eye is I ran a cartoon, um, uh, and it was called The Bipolar Duke of York. And when he was up, he was up. <laughs> and when he was down, oh, he, he, was, he was down. Anyway, I received a number of letters from people who were um, very offended by this. And I got a brilliant letter from a man who said, I suffer from a bipolar condition. Um, and when I saw your cartoon, I was absolutely disgusted. I saw it again a couple of days later, thought it was really funny. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a real letter. 
from an eye reader, and that's what I have to trust, <laughs> that people are sufficiently robust um, that they can take a joke, which, you know, a lot of humour is essentially just sort of um, political or literary criticism done with a joke, um, and people should be able to take that. But we've had a wave at Private Eye, say, over the last four years, particularly of people who've come into politics recently, um, and they're suddenly absolutely appalled at the idea that anyone disagrees with them. It started really with the Big Leave campaign, and a number of sort of middle-aged people got very energised by taking back control. Um, and if you said, well, I don't want you to, they were furious. <laughs> so our letters column was full of people saying, why do you go on and on and on? And I, I became, you know, outed as a, you know, a fairly obvious Ramona. Um, and I had to make the point that, you know, if you lose the general election, you don't just say, oh, yeah, you're right, that's it for five years. I'll shut up now. I have no further views. That's not how democracy works. Um, and again, we had it with the Scots Nats. Absolutely furious. A lot of people had found one cause, independence for Scotland. <laughs> if you disagreed with that, why? Mm -hmm. Can you just shut up? No. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. And, then, and then, you know, it was, uh, uh, we had the Corbynites, and this is the youngsters, who are very, very keen on free speech, um, providing you agree with them. Um, you know, to quote Voltaire, or to re-quote Voltaire, you know, um, I respect your right to disagree with me, except you're no platformed. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. There is a problem there in saying, you may not like the Daily Mail, but that doesn't mean you can close it down. Um, don't buy it. If you don't like it, argue against what it says. But the idea that anybody who you perceive to be disagreeing with you, and therefore you are right, must be stopped. That I find worrying. And it's not a sort of, ooh, the snowflakes, aren't they pathetic? It's just, uh, it seems to be, A, underestimating young people who are perfectly capable of arguing. Um, uh, and if you say, well, you know, perhaps Jeremy Corbyn shouldn't have appeared on Russia Today. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't an open secret that the Kremlin financed it, and perhaps he should have been more careful. How dare you? Yeah, yeah. You are Paul Dacre. <laughs> Ooh. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's not enough, really. Um, it must be possible to um, uh, make these points and to argue with people. So, no, I do, I do generally get um, a bit worried by this attempt to um, turn everything into uh, a black-and-white battle. Um, and it, it does bleed out um, mm. into, into a wider debate. So I, th I think we have to be careful about that. I think you have to be able to be reasonably robust. I think it kind of leads into, I mean, you were talking about the people that are sort of getting in touch with you directly. You were talking about the bipolar, the, yeah. the guy who wrote to you about the, bi the bipolar um, story. Um, uh, this is obviously a reader, and I'm assuming that most of your contact with readers are either people saying, yeah, good on you, Ian, or how dare you? Yes, there's quite um, a lot I mean, of mo that. Most people who are in this room are obviously working on either brands with very closely with like vast consumer intelligence and consumer insights departments. I'm guessing... I'm guessing that you don't have one of those. Do you, have, you have you ever conducted... How an dare you? <laughs> we are an so extremely professional magazine. Um, how, many, how many do you have and how do they work? Okay, we don't have any. No, I didn't think so. <laughs> <laughs> um, how do you know then? In that case, the sort of the obvious stuff of what your readers like and what they don't like, but more importantly, when it's time to change something. Yeah, um, well, we have no um, scientific basis for that. Uh, it's entirely instinct. Um, obviously, I get a lot of feedback from the readers. I mean, again, it is a sort of club, um, and they're uh, you know they're fairly rude about things they don't like. Um, they're <laughs> fairly rude about things they do like, actually. <laughs> um, and, um, well, I mean, if, if I can give you, this was um, one reader's reaction. Uh, after our coverage of the late Princess Diana, a um, number of our readers didn't like the coverage, didn't think it was sufficiently grief-stricken or respectful. Um, and someone said, dear sir, or shitbag. <laughs> Could you delete it? <laughs> you are what creeps out covered in green slime from ben beneath large flat stones. You offend the nostrils. You are beneath contempt. B.W. Cluffley, Rev. 
<laughs> That's our readers. Um, I was going to say how much so more no, you want don't... to know about them. How much do you want to know more about them? No. Um, <laughs> no, I have, a, I have a sort of ideal version in my head, and that's fine. I mean, they're well-read, well-informed, incredibly astute, uh, delightful, balanced people with a sense of humour. Mm -hmm. That's our readers. Same go for the advertisers. <laughs> do you know more about your advertisers than your readers? Yeah, well, there are rather fewer of them. Uh, <laughs> in fact, there are about three, as far as I know. <laughs> no, we've got um, Raja Suits. Indeed, uh, yeah. uh, which are very, very loyal advertiser. We have a slight problem with advertising in, in that um, it's not terribly well coordinated, the editorial and the advertising. So it does result in situations where on the left-hand page there's a, a lovely full-page ad for Virgin and um, on the right-hand page there's a picture of Balloon and Richard Branson saying, look at the prick there, <laughs> uh, uh, which again tends to mean the advertising is cancelled. Um, is Jane Ann Gardia still in the room? Uh, no, I'm I sure she no, is. No. <laughs> it, it was a long time ago. We're very responsible. I mean, we would certainly not do now, say, have a whole page advertising lingua phone on the right, and then on the left, a thing saying lingua phone or a bunch of crooks, um, <laughs> and you don't get Got much um, for your money. We wouldn't do that. Okay. That was the old days. Yeah. Last week. New private eye, New Britain. <laughs> No, so there is a problem there. You, again, advertisers would have to be robust. <laughs> Put that on the rate card. Um, what, what makes your readers cancel their subscriptions? Because they do, don't they? Um, they do. Why do they walk away from them? Um, usually they're offended by, as I say, some new political insight that they, d they haven't shared. Um, they are offended uh, on behalf of other people. Um, Again, they, they find that very, very annoying. Um, at the moment, they're, um, they're, um, they don't like cartoons of fat people. Um, uh, they think that's fat shaming. Um, even if they're cartoons about obesity. Um, so they're not very keen on that. What else aren't they keen on? Um, we get a lot of... Um, you're not going to believe this in private. There's a lot of trans versus turf wars going on okay. at the moment. Um, and one or other side is usually finding us guilty of sympathising with the other side. I'm sure you follow this. <laughs> <laughs> the transgender versus trans exclusion radical feminists. Oh, come on. <laughs> this is mainstream stuff. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, a lot of that. A lot of that going on. Truth of it is, though, actually, not that many people do walk away. You're, you're kind of towards the top of the tree in your circulation, aren't you? Well, and we these are these days. We are touch everything, having a very good circulation period, mm -hmm. um, and that may be because, as our readers say, there's nothing else to read um, <laughs> in their complimentary mode, uh, <laughs> um, and it may be just because we still believe in print, um, and that's one of the, the the few marketing insights I have um, in the. Private, I think, has largely survived by um, believing that people will buy a magazine um, and not offering it digitally, which we don't. Um, again, I didn't, I didn't go as far as the French magazine Le Canal Chenet, which literally has a website that says, go and buy the magazine, <laughs> uh, which is brilliant. Um, I'm not quite that brave, but I mean, that's more or less what you get from our website. Um, and uh, a belief that um, journalism and uh, cartooning in particular, these are skills that work best in print and that you should pay for them. And it, it's not very much. Um, you know, we're two quid now, which is almost risible um, in terms of employing 50 quite brilliant people to give you an insight into the way your life is run. Why is that not worth two quid? You've I, mean, it, it's, I mean, I used to occasionally address... Um, universities or schools and lots and lots of young people would say oh I'd like a job in um, a film or in publishing and I'd say well you can't have it because you've stolen everything um, you wanted everything for free you've stolen it and the job has all gone tough shit um, uh, we're hanging on to them and you can go whistle um, which is not what I believe but it was meant to provoke um, and I just 
I think there was a terrible decade or two of lack of confidence of, of people saying, well, why shouldn't you pay people to do jobs well? Um, and a lot of middle-aged people, a lot of middle-aged men got very, very scared mm -hmm. and thought, digital, that's it. We must plough vast amounts of money into this future in which there was no revenue, there was no advertising, and people wouldn't pay. Which, again, I'm not particularly good at economics, but I thought, given those two factors, you might Fair lose enough. money. Somebody has actually asked on, uh, on this uh, thing that we've uh, that's streaming, will Private Eye ever go digital only following NME at all? Et al? Oh, but, you, well, yes. I mean, as, as the hip young gunslingers... <laughs> <laughs> that we've always been. I mean, what, you're talking about sort of the, 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 the circulation, the revenues coming in yep. from the paper these days. One would assume that a hefty slab of that is going towards the expensive part of your paper, which one assumes is the investigative reporting yep. that you conduct. I mean, you've broken a raft of cracking stories on tax avoidance, financial misconduct. Uh, but most of these stories, or most of the ones that are sort of front of mind, are actually commercial stories. Yep. It used to be back in the day where the public's blood would boil over a political scandal. That seems to be less and less. Now it seems to have become an entertainment show, the whole world of politics. But from a commercial point of view, um, uh, is the corporate and financial world beyond redemption? Uh, what can they do to win back trust, or is the game up for them, um, for brands? For brands? Well, again, I, I, would, I would query the first bit of your question, because I think what we established was that... Um, in the end, um, the staple of, of what were meant to be political stories were just about affairs um, and were just about um, people aren't faithful to their wives, which again became less shocking as the century wore on. Um, and what I think we discovered was that the interface between government and, and um, commerce essentially was where all our best scandals would be, yeah. from PFI to tax to the works. It's the fact that the public is paying, always, um, for the risks which supposedly private enterprise is taking. And that was the area that, um, in particular, Paul Foot and Richard Brooks started writing about. And from being a, you know, a bee in the bonnet, Richard Brooks used to work for the revenue, and we lured him in to the dark side. Um, he was quite a senior civil servant, extraordinary. Um, and we decided that he should become a journalist, which, you know, was shocking. He had to apologise to his family and um, <laughs> generally. But he, he has proved absolutely extraordinary in terms of identifying um, where that, that um, failure lies. And, it, I mean, it is absolutely extraordinary. PFI itself is one of the great scandals. Um, this idea that you outsource everything. And we're beginning to see bits of it fall. I mean, Carillion, I mean, was the idea that you outsource every single function down to the point where... A cleaner was having three separate companies dealing with paying her 35 quid a week, one of which along the way was based in the Cayman Islands. Yeah, you know, th that. this is madness. And that sort of, I think, um, grotesque, um, you know, it's, it's, it's capitalism um, with its worst face on, that we have either ignored or just come to accept as standard. And I think that will stop. I mean, that is, you know, part of the reason um, a younger generation believes Mr. Corbyn is saintly um, is because he occasionally says, is that a very good way yeah. <laughs> um, to run public governance, which it clearly isn't. So, I mean, uh, your point about money, we do obsess. I mean, I think there's a great deal more of the paper is about money now than about sex. Um, I did an exchange once with the French, um, uh, with Le Canard. I went and worked there. Um, and they had an incredibly sort of cool editor called Eric Comtas. And he said to me, you English, you write about sex the whole time. Do you ever have any? <laughs> <laughs> so I said, yes, we do. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, but it, 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 it did um, ring a bell, um, even at that point. And I... One of the great things that Canada does is money, brilliantly. Is money. Yeah. I mean, the, the sort of reporting that you're talking about is obviously based on hard data and hard facts. Yes. Nine times out of ten. Everyone's livelihood on this room is based on data 
and facts and, uh, and extrapolating insight from that. Um, but we're sort of living in a world now where the, that, that sort of currency seems to be less and less important in, a, in our post-factual, post-data world where nobody seems to really care about facts and truth. What's your, what's your view on where we've ended up and are we going to be able to pull it back? Um, yes, I mean, you know, I'm basically optimistic um, and that I think a lot of these things are cyclical, but we are now, I think, in an era where... You know, Boris Johnson, he made a speech saying, you know, we've got um, our exports with Korea at 25%. I mean, they aren't. They're 0.8. So everyone says to him, they're not, Boris. They're 0.8. That's bollocks. That's bollocks by a massive margin. Can you just get something right in one of your speeches? Eight days later, goes on the radio, says it again. He literally doesn't care whether it's true or not. I mean, it's like the bus. You know, and we turned it into a kid's song. You know, the lies on the bus come round and round, and they, <laughs> they just do. Um, and that is um, <laughs> one of the problems with an intellectual discourse which says, if I feel this is true, it is. And that seems to me just bonkers and post-rational. Um, and it's in an area where you could say, well, politicians have lied, we don't trust them anymore, people, you know, in marketing lie, they tell us um, things about their products which aren't true, they tell us these things, so therefore we don't believe anything. And that's a dangerous point. Um, and, you know, I'm mean, coming from private eye where we're constantly saying, don't trust that or that. What I hope we're doing is attempting to target it and doing it with a, not with a, um, a merely emotional appeal. Because I do think that is dangerous. Yeah. It's literally people's, you say to someone, um, oh, I don't know, in a row about um, statistics, you know, they, they're saying, well, I want 50% representation of black people on television. And someone says, well, the actual figures for the number of people who are black in this country, or BME, are about 10%. So is, is that totally right? Racist time for you to go home. It's not. It's just attempting not to do it all through emotion or feeling, but attempting to do it through what you all do, which is attempting to find out what the truth is. You've spoken before about this idea of sort of targeted satire, the idea of pointing out what's bad and leaving yeah. what's good well alone. I think everyone knows kind of where you sort of stand on pointing at what's bad. Somebody was asking me earlier, what does what he in his lot, what's he got to be optimistic about? What, do you, what, <laughs> do, what does cheer you? I don't mean in sort of personal, but in, in the world that we're living in, what, what are you optimistic about? What would you think, actually, I have nothing cynical or funny to say about that, because I think it's true and honest and pure and good. Go on. <laughs> I suppose it would have to be myself. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but if you could leave yourself out of the picture just I can't, for one I just moment, can't. even uh, as a keynote, <laughs> even as a keynote, just for a minute, talk about something else. What do you uh, reckon? Um, what, what are you optimistic about? What are you well, hopeful for? I am genuinely optimistic, and, and people don't believe this, but um, because um, uh, I'm very interested in satire and I'm very interested in history, um, I tend not to get too um, panicked when a story comes round again. And people say that's either complacent or it gives you a sense of um, proportion. I mean, I, I had this, you know, my, my mother-in-law, who's 90, she said to me after Brexit, she said, it's terrible, Brexit, Trump, I've never lived in a more frightening world. And I said... In 1939, you were a teenager. <laughs> you, this is just bollocks. That was much more frightening. Yeah. And she said, yes, you're right, yes. Obviously, that, <laughs> that was rather more frightening. Um, and cancelled her subscription. And cancelled. Um, <laughs> but it, it, it is remembering that. I mean, I'm, I'm a great fan of George Orwell. And George Orwell wrote, in 1948, he said, will people stop calling each other fascists? We've just spent five years fighting against real fascists. He said, in the last year, everybody I know has been called a fascist. Village schoolmaster, postmaster, vegetarians, feminists. Everybody calls each other fascists. Can you not do this? Um, and I think that's what online does now. A lot of these things come round again. The idea that, you know, Trump is the biggest liar in public life. Have you seen Mussolini? You know, apart from the, the, the obvious similarities, the... It, <laughs> it's, um, you know, the bombast, the, the inability to, um, um, and the, the unwillingness to accept any sort of fact, except what you want, is not new. 
So one of the reasons I find I'm, I'm happy um, you know, to continue doing what I do is because I think this isn't the first time this has happened. Yeah. I mean, the winter crisis in the NHS we've just had, there's a fabulous book by Nicholas Timmins called The Five Giants about um, the social services. And he says, there has not been a year since the health service was started where there was not a winter crisis in which someone said it will not survive until January. It happens every time. Mm -hmm. Yes, there are problems to be addressed. Yes, you can get upset about it and should do, and we do. To go into total gloom and hysteria by something happening which repeatedly happens in not only British but human history seems to me despairing. So I won't do that. I want to... Um, I, I'm very aware that I want to leave as much time, a beefy amount of time for questions from the floor as well as uh, that we've... Uh, got not if they're any good. Like, <laughs> if, <laughs> of course, Ian may not... He's very reticent to... Uh, re reluctant to answer some of them. Um, y y you know, Ian, I think you're more like a, a market researcher or insight professional than you think. <laughs> I think you are. And, I, and here's why I think you are. Because uh, researchers, uh, on a daily basis, have to uh, recommend stuff, have to report on stuff, whilst hiding their own biases, while hiding their own opinion. And I think that you, sometimes, you find yourself in a similar position. How hard do you find it to comment on the world around us while not showing your political colours? And do you think you're always successful? Um, I don't think I hide very much, to be honest. Um, I think it's because my colours aren't tribal. Um, people are more confused. Um, I, I don't belong to any of the political parties, and I've always voted on a least-worst basis. Mm -hmm. um, I believe it's absolutely vital to vote. I've always voted in every election, every council election. Um, you know, all well again. I think, you know, uh, uh, it's as important to vote um, for our politicians as it is to laugh at them. Um, you know, he's a source of great wisdom. Um, I think you always should, but I do it on a, you know, um, what, I, what I believe um, they are offering at the time. So people find it confusing. Um, and, you know, I mean, I look pretty small C conservative. You know, ask Paul Merton, and he would say, well, he's a sort of upper class twit. Um, uh, and, you know, sort of Paul's appreciation of the class system is not very finely graded. Um, <laughs> as Peter will tell you. Um, but uh, um, I think people assume certain things um, because of my background or what I say or whatever, and they don't know um, where I'm coming from. But, I mean, I, I, I try and um, uh, approach politics, which is in, in the grand tradition of... Um, British satire, which is to say, you know, that's ridiculous, that doesn't work, that's actually corrupt. You know, it's vice, folly, humbug. That, that's, that's the tradition. Um, and I don't think you have to be very hidden about that. You just say, that is ridiculous. Um, and all of that comes from a belief that it could be run better. We're going to go to some questions on the floor in just two seconds, but I've got a real quick fire one for you. Here. I've got a couple oh, no. of quick fire ones that were actually fed to us earlier. So these are real short answers, one on these, and then we're going to go to the uh, then we're going to go to the audience. Greatest mistake you've made while editing the eye? Um, uh, MMR. Um, I think I ran that story too long and didn't accept the criticism early enough. Okay. Uh, dream host on Have I Got News for You? Um, oh, I think it would have to be Blair. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you think that would be one? A whole other keynote there. Uh, best private eye cover? Missing WMD round. <laughs> <laughs> best private eye cover that you've, that you've, uh, that you've created? Um, my favourite was the one that got banned in Ireland. Um, it was a picture of the Pope addressing a crowd saying, I remember the old days when boys used to want to enter the priesthood. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I've, got, I've got a couple of other questions, but I'm going to leave it there. <laughs> I'm going to leave it there. Let's throw this open to the floor. We've had a few on Slido, uh, but actually I want, I want to try and go. If you, if you ask a Slido question, stick your hand up anyway. I don't want to just go from this. Um, let's go to this lady at the front here. Hi. Um, a phrase we often use in the insight industry is... Uh, 
getting to a human truth or unearthing some human truth. And you touched upon this when talking about facts, but uh, or about um, the kind of hard numbers and. Um, but I'm more interested in it from your perspective as someone who works in satire and tre the treatment of human truth is not one hard thing that we get to that's kind of deep inside. Yep. And uh, so, um, especially in this context of post-truth, what is your kind of instinctive understanding of what human truth is today? Could you pass the mic down the line? Thank you. Go on, Ian. God, I'm just one for the Archbishop of Canterbury, isn't it? <laughs> um, what is human truth? I suppose you're saying yes. I mean, there's a fact-based bit of the eye, which is the journalism, and then there are jokes in which you are distilling what your view of the world is or what you think about the truth of the situation is. And you do it with a joke. So, I mean, I think the best jokes are the ones that express something that's true, and that's why they resonate, um, and that you're using the joke to make a comment about what you think the world should look like or, or how it does operate. Um, and I think um, that's the best the satirist can do, really. And people, people say to me, well, do you make a joke about anything? Where do you draw the line? And I draw the line, if I can defend this joke before I put it in, then I'll be happy. And then afterwards, when people say, I think that's crass or black humour or that's too grim, um, I've lost one. Um, <laughs> I can defend that and say, but I still think it's true. Um, you know, 9-11 happened, and there was... Do you remember George Bush was reading that primary school book, and he was sitting in a classroom, and an aide came up to him, and we had a brilliant photograph of it. Um, and we put it on the front cover with a bubble, and the aide saying, it's Armageddon, sir, and Bush saying, well, I'm getting out of here. <laughs> Uh, which was, you know, in the context of 9-11, um, quite poor taste. Um, but I thought it was defensible because what his first reaction was, was to run for it. Um, and that, again, was, was not presidential. So I suppose we're trying to say, what are people feeling at that point? What are they actually saying? Thank um, you, Ian. Let's go to another question over here. Hello. Um, there's a lot of talk in the world of advertising and marketing about how to persuade people of stuff. And one response is don't tell people factual information. You should appeal to their emotions and, yeah. you know, that sort of individual stories. And I wondered, you know, do you think that's true, <laughs> basically? Um, yes. I mean, I can see that that would be the received wisdom, that you shouldn't tell people... Um, uh, this will or won't work, or this is or it isn't effective, but just say, tell us your story. You know, how does it feel for you? I don't know, I would find that rather creepy. <laughs> <laughs> Any uh, other questions? Any other questions but, on the you floor? Know, I, I, that seems to be part of the same trend, really. We're going to pass the mic down here to the front, and then we're going to go along to here... One over here. By the way, just a quickie. Um, yep. uh, somebody asked last year, Danny asks, last year we had, uh, oh, I forgot to mention this to you, uh, Ed Balls was here. Okay. Uh, last year we had Ed Balls do Gangnam Style. So this year, can you floss? I don't understand what that means. Uh, I do every night. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> what is flossing? I Sorry. don't understand what floss is. Danny? It's a dance. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> We're indebted to you, as they say in court. <laughs> <laughs> Next question over here. No, God, Ed Balls. Yeah. Ian, do you have a favourite brand? If do so, I... which is it? Brand of all, all, all products? Um, yeah, Frosties. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> when I was on Desert Island Discs, I was asked what my luxury would be, and I said Frosties. Um, and then a lorry arrived at my house. <laughs> Years' supply. And my wife said, you idiot! Why didn't you say Porsche? <laughs> Mr. Trick. Um, but just before we I go to I do realise that there are other types of cereal available. Most of which are represented in this room Indeed. by various marketing directors. Um, uh, and I accept that they've probably got quite a high sugar content. I'm not, I'm not, I still really like them. <laughs> We've got a question come forward. It's quite contentious. I'm not quite sure why it's anonymous. But it's come through. Can you imagine, Ian, what your front page will be for the meeting of Trump and Mr. Kim? He's on the line now. Oh, damn it, man. <laughs> <laughs> We've been rumbled. Um, 
What do you think? So um, what's your Trump and Mr. Kim cover going to be? Well, we did a, um, you know, a, a, a Trump Kim cover about, you know, um, he's out to launch, and then we did the, the, the <laughs> fat man, and then we did the, well, you know, I'm going to have to deal with a maniac, but so's he. We did all those, and then I found that he'd retweeted half of them. Um, oh, no. It's going to be difficult. I mean, the thing that worries me is that if Trump pulls this one off, it will, it will indicate that being completely bonkers <laughs> is quite good diplomatic um, <laughs> tactics yeah, uh, yeah. internationally, which would be a, quite a grim precedent. So we're all going to be torn in the liberal media between saying, isn't it marvellous there's a peace deal, and oh, God, uh, this means he'll be bonkers on every other front. Um, so it's going to be a tough one for us. Ian, question from the front here, from a familiar face. <laughs> I just wondered, in the context of the uh, Brexit debate, is there anything you think that could have been told to the British people which would have swung the, debate, uh, the vote the other way? I don't know. Some of the facts would probably have been good. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and also some indication of what they were voting for. Um, and it was, it's just repeatedly, you know, and everybody now says it. They say, well, immigration was very much what people were voting. Well, why didn't people say at the time? What type of immigration don't you like? If you don't like immigration from Commonwealth countries, this isn't going to stop it. If you don't like refugees, they don't come from Europe. <laughs> um, you know, if you quite like Italian people working in your hospital, then don't vote the other way. You know, if you'd like this party, Mr. Farage will, ca will cater for you. But this isn't mainstream. Um, a lot of that stuff wasn't put on there. Do you want to belong to a single market? You know, that, there are a lot of farmers around where I live who were all very, very leave. And then afterward they said, do you know, our subsidies are going to be removed. <laughs> and I was going, why didn't you think? We've got a, a question. Uh, there was somebody over there. If we can just run the mic over there. And while we do that, I've got a question for you that came through on our Slido thing, which is... Uh, where's it gone? Uh, uh, so you appear on the cover of... Pri this is from Danny. Uh, so you appear on the cover of Private Eye once you have retired. What's the joke that features you? Um... Yeah, now that depends who I appoint as my successor, doesn't it? Are they being groomed at the moment? Ian? Don't use that word. Uh, <laughs> I'm the last figure from the 80s who hasn't been arrested. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've got a question over there. This is not a question. Um, this is a request. Would you... Do Jimmy Somerville? Sorry, Jimmy uh, Somerville. I think the question was: so you're very uh, Can, can you do your Jimmy Somerville impression? Please. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Another que Any other questions? Any other questions for him? One at the back. Then. I had a complaint from Jimmy Somerville. Um, I did that impression once a very long time ago, and I haven't repeated it. And Jimmy Somerville said. Um, he wrote, I think it was probably to NME, saying, the comparison is ludicrous. Ian Hislop cannot dance. <laughs> but on every other level. It was good. <laughs> <laughs> well, we had Richard Coles on the programme, who was in the communards with Jimmy Somerville. And he sat next to me and said, this is like old times. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there was a question there at the back. By the way, if you have asked a question, uh, remember who you are, uh, because um, we've got um, 10 or 12 copies of uh, Private Eye that Ian's kindly going to sign for the recent issue. Uh, there was a question over there. Bring gentlemen. your two quid up. <laughs> <laughs> we'll uh, foot it. Hello, uh, David Thackeray from Penguin Random Mouse. Thanks for the reviews. Um, I was just going to say... Uh, do you, a lot of us in this room, um, are, uh, part of our day-to-day -day job is delivering truths that people don't necessarily want to hear. Yep. Um, some of us try and do it in an entertaining way. Uh, do you ever find that the important truths that you're trying to deliver can be obscured by the tone or the humour and not actually land you know, to the masses that they need to, you know, particularly read Brexit? And that sort I, of thing. I think actually, I mean, I, I think I believe that they land better if you do them in a certain way, often um, even in um, the investigative journalism and the straight pieces we run, 
Um, I do say to journalists, you know, the one thing people will not put up with is being bored. Um, and that is part of the problem of presentation of, of difficult material. It's not that it's, it's not right or it's not exhaustive, it's just dull. Um, and, you know, one of the problems of, of, say, some of the big investigative scoops, the Panama Papers, um, the, the follow-up, the Paradise Papers, it was just 12 pages, do you want to read that? With a sort of huge amounts of dense text and 17 companies you haven't heard of and three rather complex financial vehicles. The whole trick of these things is finding what you were talking about earlier, which is the, the human story in it, um, which is, you know, you, you need to make the story in some way um, a narrative, in some way um, human. Um, and you can, you know, it's easy to do that on the joke front, but even, I mean, on the, you know, a story like um, the Paradise Papers, it's just, they're, they're, you know, 12 million files and we've got 1,097. You want to know which person is the biggest crook, how much money have they not paid that could have been used to build a school or a hospital or, or whatever. You need to make it in some way applicable. I mean, that, and that's the journalist's problem. Um, rather than saying, oh, with Brexit, there are, you know, there are 37 competencies, trade's only one of them, we've got to talk about aviation control and port authorities, and you think, oh, God, this sounds really dull. I'm bored even, even thinking about it. Um, or the medical agency and then the financial services. But, you know, when that bloke came and said, within a day there'll be a 30-mile tailback from Dover of people waiting to get through and no-one will be able to deliver, everyone suddenly thought, oh, yeah, yeah, that's not a good idea, is it? And then someone said, do you remember the Good Friday Agreement? Do you want the troubles back? No, no, we don't really. Um, that's the way to cut through, I think. Um, uh, I'm going to close with this last question to you, Ian. You've got a group of research professionals, insight professionals in this room. And you know, they don't come cheap. Yeah. Although some of them do. Who <laughs> uh, <laughs> we have learned. Um, if you did have the budget and yeah. the inclination for it, um, what would you want them to find out for you? Um, whether it's to do with the eye or in general life and society. <laughs> what, what, do you find, what do you want to know, Ian? These people will tell you. They'll I want find to, it out. I want to know the meaning of life. <laughs> Is that a couple of weeks as a project? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I suppose... I mean, half of the stuff that you think you know... I mean, this is... I mean, it's a last point. You said... Libel used to be your biggest problem. Our biggest problem now is confidentiality, privacy, which people claim about areas which are essentially, I think, should be in the public domain. And, you know, we make jokes about Max because he's the tip of the iceberg. Is everyone behind him saying, well, all my dealings are private too. This is all confidential. And trying to find out anything, really anything now, about that interface between public and private money, you're just told it's confidential. You know, how much does this hospital con to cost to run? You know, I'm afraid we can't tell you that. Why not? Well, it's owned um, by a private company. How much, you know, does it cost the parole service um, to supervise two or three? Ex I'm afraid we can't tell you that. That's run by Crapita. Capita. <laughs> Completely different brands. Um, one of them has an R in it. Um, you're basically asking them to go through bins, aren't you? Yeah. That's really <laughs> that is it. Nothing um, wrong with bins. Um, before we draw this to a close, I just want to very, very quickly say, before, we, before I um, say thank you to Ian, um, that tomorrow, uh, on the subject of comedy and satire and senses of humour, we've got a workshop that's going on upstairs. It's the final workshop of the day. I would say to everyone that if you are going to go to that tomorrow, you are going to need to fill out a pre-task uh, that is uh, um, basically described in... Uh, the program. So I just wanted to remember to do that. If you want to go to that, well, links to stuff that we've been talking today, you'll need to do that before you go to that session. But anyway, putting that aside for a second, you know, uh, without going into a whole load of detail, we've been trying for years to get Ian Hislop uh, to come to our conference. We came so close to it last year, but I'm delighted that you were able to join us this year. I know you're not going to want me to say this, but you, you're the nearest damn thing we've had on this platform to a real, true national treasure. Oh and I'm sorry, oh no, I know. No, it's know. all over. It's all over. Oh, no. <laughs> I promise I wouldn't use those words, but, you know, a, a, a true... Uh, 
an influential voice um, for this country and a, and a much valued one, and a much valued voice at this conference today. Please, would you join me in thanking the great Ian Hislop. Thank, thank you very much, Ian. Really, you. made it very easy. <laughs> thank you. Um,